The title of our upcoming experiment is The Method of Initial Rates, and our goal in this experiment is to determine reaction orders for a reactant and a catalyst in a reaction, specifically the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide catalyzed by iron 3, or Fe3+. The method of initial rates involves running a reaction at different initial concentrations and looking at the effect on the initial rate as we vary the concentration systematically. In this experiment, we're going to do that with a few twists. Rather than measuring concentrations, we're going to be measuring pressures, specifically the pressure of oxygen gas released by the reaction. And you're going to have the opportunity to design your own reaction conditions in order to isolate the effects of hydrogen peroxide and iron 3 on the rate. So although our overall goal is to get to the reaction orders, there's some thinking about stoichiometry and reaction design that goes into this experiment as well. I want to begin by talking somewhat theoretically about kinetics and starting at the beginning, which is the definition of reaction rate. We define the rate of a chemical reaction as the change in concentration of a reactant or a product per change in time. So if, for example, we follow the concentration of a product of a reaction over time, here I've got the co product concentration in brackets as a molarity and time on the x-axis, then we can define the average rate as the change in concentration per change in time between these two points. This would be what we would call an average rate. We can also define the instantaneous rate as the derivative of this concentration versus time curve at a particular point. Another way to think about this is that the average rate is the slope of the line connecting two points on this concentration versus time curve. We're specifically in this experiment interested in the initial rate, which is the rate at time t equals zero, the rate at the beginning of the reaction. And we can think theoretically about this anyway as the derivative at t equals zero, although in practice what we have to do is use a few of the initial points of the reaction to define a line and call the slope of that line the initial rate. We'll explore how to do this in the context of this experiment a little bit later in the video. Now, one thing you'll notice if you examine the shape of the blue curve here is that the rate varies as the reaction proceeds. The rate appears to slow down, in fact, as the reaction goes forward, and the reason for that is that the rate depends on concentration. As concentration changes, the reaction rate changes. We can express that mathematically in the form of an equation called the rate law, which says that the rate is equal to a constant, the rate constant, which we won't deal directly with in this experiment, times the concentrations of the reactants raised to a power. So in our case, the concentration of hydrogen peroxide plays a role, and it's raised to the power m. And the concentration of iron 3 plus plays a role, and it's raised to the power n. These powers m and n, although they resemble the exponents in, for example, an equilibrium expression, have to be measured through kinetics experiments, and these are called the orders of reaction, and our primary goal in this experiment is to determine these orders of H2O2 and iron 3 plus. To do this, we're going to apply the method of initial rates, which requires these initial rate measurements, so we're going to need a concentration versus time curve, or analogous data, as we'll talk about later, and we also need an understanding of the initial concentrations, the concentrations of reactants at that initial t equals zero time point. To understand that, we need to think a little bit about how the reaction is set up. So what we're going to do is add solutions of hydrogen peroxide and water, aqueous hydrogen peroxide and aqueous iron 3 plus, and the reaction will happen from there. At t equals zero, at the moment the reaction begins, we actually know these concentrations purely from stoichiometry. You'll have a reagent bottle of hydrogen peroxide with a concentration written on it. You'll have an iron 3 plus bottle with its concentration written on it. Using those stock concentrations and the total reaction volume, we can easily calculate the initial concentrations of H2O2 and Fe3+. From there, we can then relate these initial molarities to the initial rate to deduce the rate law and the orders. You can see from the rate law equation that if we know the concentrations of H2O2 and Fe3+, and we use multiple runs to remove K from the equation, We'll talk a little bit more about that, and I have an example video on the method of initial rates that you can look at if that's still unclear. You can see that the only remaining unknowns are M and N, the reaction orders. Now I want to get into talking about some of the specifics of the reaction we'll study, the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide in water. Aqueous hydrogen peroxide is unstable. Over time, it will decompose into liquid water and gaseous oxygen, although 
In your typical grocery store solution of hydrogen peroxide, for example, this process is relatively slow. When we add a species such as iron 3 plus, we can speed up this reaction and the iron 3 plus is acting as a catalyst. And the reason it's written above the arrow like this is it doesn't really play into the balanced chemical equation. It's not consumed in the course of the reaction, but it does participate in the reaction mechanism and therefore it does appear in the rate law. So in studying the kinetics of this reaction, we need to care about both the hydrogen peroxide and the iron 3 plus catalyst. Both of them, from the perspective of kinetics, you can think of them both as reactants. The concentration of hydrogen peroxide is difficult to get a handle on since the species is colorless and it's difficult to measure. And so rather than measuring the hydrogen peroxide concentration over time, we're going to focus on the oxygen gas and measuring that over time. In particular, what we're going to do is run the reaction inside an Erlenmeyer flask that's closed so that all of the oxygen gas produced remains contained within the reaction vessel. This flask is going to be connected via a rubber stopper to two things. First of all, a syringe, which you see on the left, and a stopcock. That's how we're going to deliver the hydrogen peroxide. So the catalyst solution, the iron 3 plus and possibly deionized water, will be in the flask already. We're going to deliver the hydrogen peroxide with that syringe. And the other port in the stopper will be connected to a pressure gauge, which is connected to the LabQuest 2. And so this is where, how we're going to follow pressure of the gas over time. As the reaction proceeds, oxygen gas is generated, that will cause an increase in pressure within the reaction system. If you think about the way the ideal gas law works, right, PV equals NRT, if the temperature is constant and the volume of the reaction vessel is constant, then pressure and number of moles are directly proportional. So measuring the pressure of O2 then is just as good as measuring the number of moles and therefore the concentration, since volume is constant, of the O2 gas produced. So measuring pressure is equivalent to measuring concentration and we're going to express the reaction rate as atmospheres per second, a pressure change per unit time. In doing that, we're going to get a graph that looks something like this. Now this looks very different from the theoretical graph that we showed on the last slide. This looks like kind of a mess and I will be honest, when I ran this reaction just a few weeks ago, um, I was very surprised to get a curve like this, but we can get a handle on what's going on and we can identify the initial rate here. A few things are going on here. First of all, before you add the hydrogen peroxide, there should be at least a few data points before the reaction starts. This allows us to get a baseline measure of the atmospheric pressure, which is typically going to be a little bit less than one atmosphere. At the moment the H2O is added, you'll notice the pressure jump. This has to do with the fact that we've actually compressed the volume available to gas a little bit since we've added liquid in there in the form of aqueous hydrogen peroxide. What's striking about this point is the reaction doesn't appear to start immediately. You'll notice this visually. There are no bubbles that form for a few seconds. There's maybe a 20 to 30 second, possibly longer, depending on the concentration of hydrogen peroxide and catalyst, induction period, in which not much seems to happen. In the induction period, a step is happening that doesn't lead to products necessarily, but is part of the mechanism en route to products. After that induction period, though, you'll notice a linear region a region of the pressure versus time curve where things seem to be increasing linearly, and this is where we're going to get our initial rate. The slope of this linear region is more or less proportional to the initial rate. In order to determine the orders, we're going to need to run the reaction multiple times and obtain multiple curves at different initial molarities of H2O2 and Fe3+. The first run of the reaction, which I tend to think of as kind of the base run, we're going to start with concentrations of H2O2 and Fe3 plus that I'm just calling X and Y. The actual values you'll see for the analysis don't matter so much. It's the change in each concentration between the different runs that's really the key. In run two, and it will be up to you to design based on the parameters in run one and what concentrations we'd like to achieve, it'll be up to you to design this. Our goal here is to produce a reaction solution that has the same total volume. That's important so that the pressures are directly comparable. If we change the volume accessible to the gas, right, we're changing its pressure, which means we wouldn't be able to compare the pressures in run one and two directly. And we want to double the iron three plus concentration and leave the H2O2 concentration the same so that this way, we'll talk more about this in a second, we can use runs one and two 
to determine the effect of Fe3 plus on the initial rate and therefore the order, the reaction order of Fe3 plus. Run 3 is the same idea, but for H2O2. We're going to leave the Fe3 plus concentration the same, leave the total reaction solution volume the same, using deionized water if necessary to bring the volume up to where it needs to be, and we're going to cut the H2O2 concentration in half and look at the effect on the initial rate, look at the effect on the slope of that linear region. So finally, in closing, I'll just point you to runs 1 and 2 and remind you that if you look at these runs, only the iron 3 plus concentration changed. And so any change in the initial rate must be due to the concentration of iron 3 plus. From that, and by doing a little bit of math, we can deduce the reaction order of Fe3 plus. And if you'd like more information on the theory and the math behind the method of initial rates, I'll link to a video in the description for this video that has more on the in method of initial rates from a theoretical perspective.